I think as I get older that Easter becomes more, more, more a season and a time that speaks to me than Christmas. I really do think Christmas is a very suitable young person's holiday. It's full of pleasures and anticipations, but it's also fairly simple. It's the whole new life at winter, light and the darkness motif. It's beautiful. Easter, though, is contrary, isn't it? It's all about death in the springtime, darkness in the light. It's a little more complex. It's, it's, it's for adults, let's be honest. And so this is a good Sunday to reach the end of a passage that Matthew and I have been walking with you for the last few weeks on the spirituality of adulthood, about making choices, about earnest and real work, about making relationships that matter, and as I said last week, about something called creative destruction, the reality that we have to demolish parts of our lives in order to create other parts of our lives. And we know this as grown-ups, that we're always giving things up in order to take things on. It is, in some ways, the most profound spiritual challenge of adulthood because all our lives we acquire things, things, really things, but also relationships and connections and memories. And then at some point we realize we can't hold on to everything we have We know the people who try to, those people whose houses are stacked up with magazines, those hoarders, you've seen them on television. They're quite, I say pitiful in the sense that we can feel pity for their desire to hang on to life even as it goes through their fingers. And in some respects, this creative destruction challenge is precisely what Easter is about. Jesus arrives in power. If I'm not mistaken, that hallelujah chorus we heard was from the beginning probably around the, uh, was it part of the procession into Jerusalem? Jesus arrives in power like he did last Sunday to the words of Psalm 118. Blessed is he who cometh in the name of the Lord. If you read John, he gets ready for it by raising Lazarus from the dead the day before. Now there is something to prove you're important. And then he goes right into the temple and flogs people left and right telling them they've made it into a den of thieves when it should be, as he quotes Isaiah, again, a house of prayer for all people. He confounds the experts in the temple. He's on the verge of taking over the whole place. And then, without saying a word, he gives it all up. A complete reversal. The mighty leader becomes the passive prisoner. He stands in front of Pilate, who asks him questions and gives him enigmatic answers. What is truth? I don't know. You you are the king of the Jews. You say that I am. They take him out and they execute him like a criminal in public, and people say, save yourself if you're so powerful, and he doesn't. We know he could, of course, because we've been reading the book up until this point. We know he could do this, but he doesn't. He takes it all. Of course, theologians have been working on this for 2,000 years. There are whole libraries devoted to understanding or trying to understand this bizarre story. But you see, it's very simple to explain. In fact, it's so simple it gets overlooked. It's the thing right in the middle, right in front of you. And here's where I have to tell a different story. It's a short story, don't worry. So when I'm a young father, my sons want to learn to ride a bike, right? And so you put them on the bike, and what do you do? You hold it behind, right? Or sometimes you hold the, and and they're they're on it, and they're wobbling back and forth, and they're very frightened. But you hold it up for them, right? And then you try to go a little faster. And they still wobble, and eventually they get fast enough where you can't keep up and you let them go. And if you're really good, they don't notice. This is the meaning of Easter. Not very dramatic, I understand, but this is what it's about. For three years, Jesus had been showing, holding, guiding, doing it all, healing the the lame, pronouncing the words, telling the disciples what to do. It was time to let go, to yield, to surrender, to give up his ownership of the message because if they don't do it, it won't happen. 
This is a sermon I've given in some form to every church I've served. I think it needs to be done over and over again, if only for my sake, is that whether you think Jesus died and rose from the dead or died and stayed in the tomb, one thing we have for sure, we can say he's not here. And the message was left behind. He stopped holding the bike. At some point, all of us, especially adults, especially as we reach a point where we realize there are fewer years of work ahead, fewer years of life ahead than are behind us. At some point, we look around and realize we haven't gotten it all done, have we? How many of you start out as youths and you look around and say, I'm going to start a business or I'm going to become rich. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to write two books. You have dreams, really big dreams. You should have big dreams. You're full of life. As they say, your whole life is in front of you. But then you get to a certain point, and I'll pick my age because that's where the one I know. I'm 57. Most of my life is back here now. And there are no books back there. There's no wealth back there. There's no fame back there, no fortune, no glory back there. And what's in front doesn't leave me much room to make up for those things I didn't do. You've all faced that or will face that moment when you realize your hopes for your life didn't come out the way you expected. And you might well think, boy, am I a failure. Or I let myself down or I wasn't good enough. But I'm here to tell you that's not true. And this is what dawned on me this year. And I can only talk about myself because I'm the person who will get angry at me if I get it wrong. That's why I won't talk about you. I looked around this year and realized this is the fifth, I'm finishing five years of being with you. And when I arrived, I realized I had maybe 15 years of able-bodied service in front of me. So I'm a third of the way in before I have to leave the business altogether. And I haven't gotten nearly enough done. And I came with a vision of a new heaven and a new earth. I've had it my whole life, by the way, and I hope to help it happen here. In fact, I was so intent on it that a couple of years ago I flogged you all mercilessly about not doing it. It was terrible. It was terrible because I was wrong to do that. Not wrong in my dream, I should point out. I was wrong in thinking I could make it happen because that's the lesson of adulthood, ultimately, is that we can't make things happen. We live in an entrepreneurial culture. We celebrate the self-made millionaire, the Bill Gateses of the world, the Warren Buffets, who rise in the morning, think great thoughts, press a button, and billions of dollars come cascading into their lives. We celebrate the people who invent things, the people who do things. This is a get-up-and-do-it culture, and I haven't gotten anything done. Have any of you ever had that feeling, even a little bit? Of course you have. And then I thought about Jesus this year. Yes, liberals think about Jesus. We think about him a lot. I think about him more than many Christians do. And I thought about when I taught my kids to ride a bike, and now the most beautiful moments in my fatherhood have been the moments I have let go. I have two wonderful sons. They're not a bit like me, and for this I thank all the gods I can imagine. (laughs) What I mean to say is not that they're better than me, although they are. They're different from me. And yet they have values and hopes and dreams that I admire. I tell people I want to be like my sons when I grow up. These are men worthy of my admiration. And that would not have happened if I had told them when to do this and how to do that and showed them how to write and showed them how to add and walked alongside the bicycle the whole bloody way. They had to ride it, fall down, get it backwards.